I, I, I mean, think about it. You could let that get to your head of like, oh, this person's not funny. They're not funny. And you could let yourself believe that. Or this person's not worth the money that they're asking for and they're greedy and they're a bimbo. And you could like internalize that. And that could just be kind of the beginning of the end. I, I think it's always really difficult to be met with a narrative and have the audacity to tell yourself a different story about yourself. Christine, it's so good to meet you. I, um, I'm just glad to have you here today. Welcome. Thank you. Thank you so much, Christopher. I'm excited to be here. Yeah, it's going to be a fun conversation today. And I always, especially with new guests and people I've not met yet, Christine, I always love to start with the backstory. And I think I want to start here just because of, uh, I think, the trajectory of your life. TV apparently came really earlier in your life, but I'd love to hear how it all came to be. Yeah, of course. Um, you know, I always say I fell into this business and I think a lot of that is true. I believe that, uh, I believe our paths, um, are kind of defined by a little bit of preparation, opportunity, and a lot of luck. <laughs> and especially when it comes to the entertainment business. So, um, I moved to Atlanta when I was six and I was doing a lot of dancing. I was a small, tiny person. So organized sports were not necessarily calling my name. Um, so I did a lot of dance and was always very interested in putting on shows for my parents and my friends and anyone who would ever watch. Uh, so my mom at the dance studio, I saw that there was a drama class and I really wanted to try it out. I loved watching Carol Burnett. I, I was just drawn to it. Um, so being an only child, my parents were very, very supportive in any endeavor that I wanted to pursue. And um, they put me in acting classes and I just thrived. I loved it. I was, I auditioned for a children's theater company and was involved in that in Atlanta. And I was doing competition dance and it was just being on stage felt like the right place for me always. And it was kind of through there that we got an ended up going on a few auditions on a, on a lark for some regional commercials in Atlanta and that, you know, small time stuff. And I booked a few and booked a national and then it was sort of like, Hmm, she seems to like this. Should we <laughs> yeah. get an agent? Maybe we need an agent. And the thing that hmm. worked for my favor as a child was that I was, because I was small, I looked like hmm. I was six, but I was eight or nine and I could take direction and I could memorize lines, wow. but I looked like a little girl. So, you know, when you, as a director now, when you have, you want a child that looks like they're six, but they can work the hours of an eight or nine year old and they can take direction. Mm -hmm. That's uh, it's an advantage. So I did a lot of commercials and print in Atlanta and um, a couple TV movies that rolled through things like that. I was spotted by an agent uh, at a, um, resort in South Georgia with my theater company and she saw something in me and she and my mom kept in touch and didn't really know how that was going to ever pan out. But about a year later, my mom took me to California for my spring break and we did a few auditions and made some demo tapes back in the day when you would make a tape <laughs> and it would be huge. Yeah, it would be on sure. beta. It would be this massive tape. And, uh, a few months later, they were looking for the role of Al Lambert on step-by-step Step, and a producer, Bob Boyette saw my tape and they asked me to fly out. And my dad, again, only child, my dad had a bunch of frequent flyer miles and he used them to send me and my mom out for that audition. And the rest kind of is history, um, in terms of step-by-step Step, anyway. So sure, that sure. became the next seven years of of my life. Yeah. I love that you talked about preparation <laughs> and opportunity. No, for sure, Christine. And I, I actually want to nuance the idea of what that was like as an only child. But I want to start here because I find it interesting. You, you mentioned preparation and opportunity. And, you know, for folks joined with us today that are really wanting to drill down in and dial in on personal growth and, um, really honing on, honing in on becoming their best. Talk to me about, the value of discipline and repetition that you learned really early in life. If I'm not mistaken, like step by step, you were how old again? Nine or was it 12? I started when I was 12. Yeah. But I had okay. been doing professional gigs um, since I was eight because I came up in theater. 
And I did a lot of theater growing up. I did theater also in my 20s. I think that did give me, and the dance as well, there's a certain amount of repetition that goes with all of that. The amount of rehearsals, the amount of times that you practice before you ever set foot on a stage Mm -hmm. with a live audience. Um, The idea that you go to classes to better strengthen your skills so that you can perform that double pirouette or whatever that is. Um, The fact that I was, you know, eight, nine, ten, doing my own changes backstage doing my own makeup, hauling my props from one place to the next, knowing what the next, like, um, what was next in the lineup, knowing that I was on stage next and when my cue was to go. There were a lot of things that I already innately knew, even though I had never worked on a primetime sitcom before, but I had been on sets and I had done theater. So by the time I got there, I was like, oh, I get it. It's a play. We're doing a play and there are three cameras, but there's a studio audience, just like a live audience. And there's feedback. That's and cold. there's repetition of rehearsal. Yeah. So in a weird way, even though I had not done that job before, I had enough experience to where I wasn't completely green. Uh, and then that opportunity. It's really so much about like, I didn't know when that opportunity was coming. Why was I going to California with my mom for my spring break and making a demo tape? Like you could ask yourself, is this ever going to pay off? Is anyone going to ever see this tape? You could talk yourself out of things a hundred times, but why not, you know, why not make, that was the only tool we had at the time. We didn't have Skype and Zoom and, and all of that. So we made the tape, not knowing if anyone was ever going to see it. And it just so happened that the producer of that show walked by the control room as I was making the tape, remembered me, and two months later said, where's that girl? Let's find her. I mean, that's lightning in a bottle. That's luck. But that's also a little bit... Then I had the opportunity and I had to nail it. I had to get to California. So (laughs) my parent, my dad had had, you know, someone had to get me there and... And I was fortunate enough and uh, privileged enough to be able to have the the access to to go to California with my mom. And then I had to be ready to like know the lines and nail it. And I didn't have, there was no pressure on me either. I, it was just, I was always following the thing that felt good, the thing that felt right, the thing that I wanted to do. And I think as a child, that was extraordinarily beneficial because it was always fun. And my parents made it such. When this stops being fun, we stop doing it. There was never any pressure to perform. There was never any pressure to like make money or be a star or be famous or any of that. That stuff like happened and we could talk about that in a different way, but not as a child. Yeah. No, Christine, you've given us sort of a masterclass already on personal development. I want to sort of double click on a few things. Have you read the book Atomic Habits by James Clear? Yes, I do know about Atomic Habits. Yes. Right. So, you know, he talks about getting 1% better. And you said this, I didn't know when the opportunity was going to show up. And I think in life and folks lean into this. I think in life, Christine, when an opportunity comes to be, it's too late to prepare. I don't know if there's anything else you want to nuance or say about the fact that being reflexive in various disciplines of life requires preparation when no one else is watching so that when everyone else is watching, what you're doing comes out of a a place of authenticity. Is there anything else you'd want to say about that? I I really find your experience to be uh, educational for all of us that are saying, hey, how do I get better today? Because what you did at such a young age was reflexive. Yes. It was. And I could talk about that in where I am today. Um, I don't think that there has ever been a moment in my adult life in which I haven't had to call upon that reflexive skill. And I'll I'll be specific about it um, by way of example. So, you know, making my way in the entertainment business as an artist for as long as I've been doing this, you can do the math, uh, since I was eight and I'm now 45. Um, it has been my only job ever, but within that I've had many jobs. I've been a producer. I've been a choreographer. I've been an actor. I've been a voice actor. I've been a director. Um, I've done a, a, I've done so many different jobs and that's all by means of pivoting 
in times in which this business has not always been linear. So in order to continue to do that, and sometimes I find it to be quite exhausting, uh, to be frank, but there have always been moments in my life when I thought to myself, why am I doing this job? Why am I deciding to, I have this dance background and people keep asking me to choreograph, but this wasn't the path I thought. I, I thought I was an actor, but now I'm doing this thing. Okay, I'll do this thing. I was open to it. I was open to just whatever it was without thinking in my head, oh, no, no, no. This is not what you signed up to do. This is not part of your plan. This is not part of your, like what you're putting out to the world. But I didn't know where it was going to ever pay off. I just knew that I had a skill. People were asking me to do stuff. And I thought, well, if nothing else, it'll be interesting. And maybe I'll, maybe I'll learn something from it. And where that ended up leading me, after 10 years of being a choreographer in film and television, it led me to the show on ABC called The Goldbergs, when which I was the choreographer for five years. And during that time, I had decided I wanted to direct television and tried with all my might to get myself in the door and was doing all of these reflexive things. I was directing music videos for friends. I was directing short films. I was anything someone had an idea for. I was like, I'll direct it for free. I'll direct it for free. What do you want me to do? Because I knew that I needed the practice and I knew I needed the real. I needed to be able, when the time came, to show somebody something I did. Even if it was just a music video or whatever. you got to show somebody that you've done something. But I didn't know where any of it was leading. And at times, was it frustrating? Absolutely. At times, did I second-guess myself? 100%. I wouldn't be human if I didn't have those moments of being like, what have I done with my life? <laughs> We've all had those moments of like, do I just keep going? But I'll tell you this, year six on that show, I had built enough goodwill and enough relationships that en enough of those stars aligned, that preparation and that opportunity presented itself. And the creator of that show said, let's see her reel. And I handed over everything I had done. It wasn't a network TV show. But of course, I didn't have the opportunity yet. So that's what I was going for. But I was given the shot. I was given one shot. And that shot turned into five more years of directing that, that show. That was my foot in the door. And it wouldn't have happened had I not said yes to choreography seven years before that. So, you know, do you ever know where you don't ever really know where some of these linear paths that you think you have set out for yourself are going to end up. So sometimes, especially in the creative arts, I think you're so expected to know how to do everything now. Content creators are their own DPs, are their own writers, are their own producers, do the camera work. You know, actors are putting themselves on tape. You have to know how to do your own makeup, your own lighting. Now you have to tape yourself, find a reader. You know, these are all things that are expected of you now. So I think, but I do think all of those little skills end up adding up to, if you're, if you're aware of all of them and you can use all of them as some kind of a teaching lesson for yourself, they do end up paying off somewhere down the road. Because you think to yourself, oh, I've done that before. Hold on. I think I know how to do this. What about this? <laughs> I think I know how to light this scene. I could do this if I had to, you know. Right. This is so valuable. And folks, listen, I want you to lean into Christine's wisdom here because we began our conversation today, Christine. The first th three things you mentioned were preparation, opportunity, and then a value for or uh, the appearance of luck. And we talked about discipline. What I hear you saying is, for us to move forward in life, none of us should negate the fact that where we're at right now is inevitably a building block. We should give it our all. You said this, you knew you had a skill. How do we know, how did you know which doors to knock on then? Here's what, here's what I mean. For all intents and purposes, I think you're Al Lambert on a huge TGIF show. <laughs> Maybe some folks think, oh, she just she just got it because of her um, TGIF history. But I just heard you say the exact opposite. There was a level of grit and resilience, and I'm right here right now. I'm going to steward this really well. You want to walk us through this whole process of discerning which doors I should really knock on, 
um, recognizing and developing a skill you have. Like this is a lot of, um, this requires a lot of character and integrity. I, that's what I perceive. Um, well, thank you. I, I think so. A couple things after step by step ended, um, that was a big turning point in my life. I was 20, no, I was 19 years old. Uh, I was going to college and wondering if anyone would ever hire me again. <laughs> you can be on a really big TV show and people will think, oh, you've got it made. But actually, if you've been on a big TV show for a significant amount of time, you're not in a casting room. No one's remembering you in that regard. They still think of you as being 12 years old. Isn't she 12 years old? And you're like, no, she's 19 now. Oh, but she's she is a kid actor. Because no one's necessarily in the business watching Friday night television, let's be clear. So it's it's not, it wasn't necessarily, it's almost like I had to start over. I had to make relationships and build relationships and get into rooms and producers had to see me in a new way. And, you know, there's a, there can be a stigma of that. You only know how to do one thing. So why would you go out for dramatic roles? You only do comedy. And that's still, that's still a bit of a stereotype that happens with actors. Um, so I was rebuilding my career in that way. I was going to college and majoring in communications because part of me thought, what if it doesn't work out? <laughs> what else do I do in life? I'm a smart and I'm a smart person. So I shouldn't just, you know, I should have, I should have options maybe. Um, so I was kind of straddling these worlds, but needing to fill my soul, needing to fill my creative soul in between all the auditioning and in between the little jobs and the little wins here and there, which again, sometimes you audition 20, 30, 40 times until you get the one job. You know, that's a lot of time in between where you ask yourself, am I still good at this? So I got involved. I went back to my roots. I went back to the thing that I knew, the thing that felt good. And I started doing theater and I was plugged in with a group of people with a theater company that became some of my closest friends. Uh, it was a place I felt free. No one does theater for money. <laughs> Obviously, that's not why I was doing it. I was doing it because I needed I needed the community. I needed the artistic community and I needed a place to feel like I could continue to work on my craft. And an acting class can do that for you too, but it was within that theater company as everybody's just piling in. I I can do this. I can make a costume. I can help with a change. I'll do a prop. They needed a choreographer. And I had never considered myself as such, but I knew how to dance and I knew how to count and I knew kind of what shapes were. I had done enough of it, competitive dancing, that I said, I can do that. I raised my hand and I started choreographing for the theater company, low stakes, because they literally had no one else. So, <laughs> so I, you know, but I was, I was working on this craft and again, it was sort of this I got cast in a show called Reefer Madness. It was a movie musical for Showtime. I was up in Vancouver for a couple of weeks. I only worked a few days on the film, but I was there for a long time. And the choreographer, Marianne Kellogg, asked if I would be part of her skeleton crew. She needed some dancers to work out some of her dances. And so I got to watch this Emmy Award winning choreographer do what she did. And I got to watch her process I was, that was a total luck moment. And it was in that moment that I gained a lot of knowledge. And somehow that knowledge ended up about choreographing for film and television and what she was building and how she was doing it. When I left that show, I had new relationships, not only with her, but with first ADs who eventually were the people who gave me my first television job on True Blood. And they called me in because they knew I was good with actors. I was one. And they knew I knew how to. And by that point, I felt confident because I had been doing it in theater for a long time. And I'd been nominated and all of this stuff in theater. So I had this small sense of confidence in walking into a brand new thing that I really, I, I mean, I, it was, you know, I didn't, it wasn't like I went to school and I majored in dance, <laughs> you know? So so I think that I think that there are are ways that that wasn't a career I was necessarily 
setting my sights on, but it was a career that I had had these building blocks moving towards. And again, there's a lot of reasons. I guess I could have said to myself, I was on a primetime TV show. I shouldn't be doing theater for free. I could have let my ego lead with right. that. Right? Yes. But I tried to let my art, my artist lead. And I think so many times we, we talk about the free work we do as artists, but some of it is really valuable because you, I think you have to continue using your skills all the time in order to be ready, in order to be prepared for when that opportunity comes up. If you're not using your art and two months go by and you get this huge audition, of course there's going to be nerves. Of course there's going to be rattling and how do I do this? And I don't know if I remember. And it's the same with directing. You know, we've had a massive strike in our industry there have been numerous articles about how slow the industry is. How do you remember how to do a job that you're not doing every day? And how do you remember that you're good at it? You remember you're good at it by continuing to do it in any way you can. And that's where, I mean, that's where I'm at right now with doing branded content and doing, you know, short films. And I just, I just keep keeping the muscle sharp, keeping the muscle ready when the next big thing comes. So I don't know. I, it, my life has been a lot of um, yes and. <laughs> yes and. I can do that. Yes and. I'll try it. And a lot of light bulb moments. For me, like with directing, I was sitting around as a choreographer for how many years? Almost 10, watching directors in television who I've been in television my whole life. And there was just one day where I was watching and again, it was like shadowing all these directors because I'd be waiting for my scene or whatever it was. And I thought to myself, why am I not doing that job? Hold on. I think I could do that job. I know exactly what they're going to do next. I know what I would do next. And I know how to talk to the actor. And I know. And so for me, it was just, it was the light bulb. And then it was the, how do I, how do I pivot? And that's, that's the next part, right? <laughs> This is this is so good, Christine. I think I've been trying to pinpoint this characteristic I see in you, and obviously this is the first time we've talked, but through your story and what you're teaching us today, I'm trying to perhaps uh, identify this character trait. I think I just nailed it, and I think what I see in you is teachability. You were talking moments ago about letting your ego lead versus letting your artist lead. Juxtapose mm -hmm. letting your ego lead and for all of us who are, again, wanting to just step into greater levels of personal development and just be our best, just showing up today. Yeah. What does it mean to let your ego lead versus to stay teachable? Because I think what you've demonstrated mm -hmm. is a level of, I'm going to remain a student of all of this to keep, as you said, to keep my muscles tight and limber. I think no matter where you are in life, or what industry you're in. Um, if you approach as if you know it all, all the time, I think you miss, I think you, you allow yourself to develop blind spots towards things that could actually up level your game. And a lot of times, if we let our ego lead, it can, I think, take away that curiosity. And even more so, not every decision we make in business or in work or what creative endeavors is going to be the greatest thing you've ever made. Sometimes there are going to be mistakes. And sometimes you're going to think, ah, I would have done it better that way. Ah, the next time I'll do this. Yeah, yeah. And instead of sort of letting yourself like spiral into that how can mm -hmm. these things be the teachable moment for the next time how can i up level the next time and what did i learn from this that i can do better like let me almost make a checklist of ah remember to do this next time ah don't ever forget that that will be better next time because i think we're we're all just if we're going to be if we're going to continue to stay creative and stay curious we have to also be a little bit, we have to be open to sometimes our own 
failures, I'll call them failures, they're not really failures, our, our own, you know, uh, moments of dissatisfaction with our work. If we gloss over them and we let the ego lead and we, we, we pass the buck and say, well, it was this person's fault and it was that person's fault. And well, I, but I, you know, uh, then I, then I don't know that I wonder if that serves us in the long run. And also I, I think being curious and being open allows us to also collaborate and learn from others. You can be better by, and I, I say this all the time, you can be better by up-leveling those around you. And that's especially cr- true when you work on a team, whether that's in business or whether that's, you know, in certainly on set, we are like a tiny family. And it doesn't mean that just because I'm the director, somebody else can't have a good idea. And I can say, you know what, actually, that's a great idea. Thank you for bringing that up. Awesome. We're going to go with your idea. And that doesn't make me weak. Just because I'm supposedly the one at the top telling everyone what to do, I don't view it. I never view it like that. Everyone's entitled to a better idea than mine. Because aren't we all just trying to make something that we're all proud of and that we all like? That's good. Yeah. Wow. Well, you grew up in a fishbowl for all intents and purposes. I'm curious. You and I sort of chatted offline about this over email. Like, How did that impact your mental and emotional health? into young adulthood like you said you you were so young um when you started on step by step season seven i think you said you were 19 but i'm just curious about that yeah it's uh it's unique to grow up on television um i'm i will say i'm happy that i experienced it without the scrutiny that i think a lot of young stars have now with social media Um, there really wasn't, that wasn't a factor. And the most you would have, there was no paparazzi really back then. You might go to a red carpet or you might be featured in like a teen beat magazine. Uh, but it was all fairly innocent. So that being said, it was certainly not the level of scrutiny that I think exists today. However, comma, um, it definitely, I don't think anyone can prepare you especially a young person, for what it's like to suddenly be very recognizable and to be in public and have people stare at you or to feel as though you have to turn it on. Um, You know, I would have people say, like, they would follow me around in a mall. Um, Or just feeling like you need to be kind of aware of your own behavior or what you're wearing or how you look. And that's, none of that's normal. None of that's really, none of that's normal. And, and feeling already sometimes so vulnerable at 14 or 15 or 16, I think everybody can relate to that. (laughs) Feeling like all you want to do is blend in. Sometimes you just want to wear what everyone else is wearing and you just want to be normal and you don't want to have anybody like looking at you. So being on television and especially sometimes doing things that were goofy or that were, you know, storylines of like getting your first bra, like that's a liability in your social life. That's not cool at all. You don't return to school. Everyone thinks, "Oh, but you were like a movie star." So you return to school and you're the most popular kid. Guess what? No, I wasn't. <laughs> I was gone half the time. And I went to a real school and went to a, an actual school, <laughs> not just tutors, but I was gone half the time. I had the pressure of trying to maintain my grades while working on a TV show. People just assume that it's a certain way and your life is easy and it's glamorous and it's just like, and you're the most popular person around. And that's oftentimes not the case. So, you know, balancing, I think the two worlds was, I got good at it, but it was tricky because it was almost like I lived two different lives. I lived a life in California where I was working and I was with my family, my TV family, and it was just really warm and fuzzy and I was doing what I loved, you know, and then I'd go back to the, the jungle of middle school (laughs) in a real school in which you, I completely felt sometimes like I was socially behind because I didn't know I didn't know the stories. I didn't go to that party. I wasn't on that team. So kind of floating around a little bit and trying to find my people, um, which I found, you know, but they were like 
they were the theater kids and the glee kids and you know and they were great but i think more than anything even more than being kind of growing up on television and i think it's different for everyone i i had a really amazing tv family and amazing producers and i felt really loved and supported and cared about um and i don't think everybody grows up in that kind of environment unfortunately i never felt exploited i never felt it, i didn't i just it was wonderful so i was lucky um but what i think more than that is and i've seen this time and time again and i think it's why ch child actors get sort of a stereotypically bad rap is that uh a lot of the self worth as a kid in that prefrontal cortex that is not quite you know formed and is fed accolades and is fed you're the best and you're so great and you're so wonderful and you know and is maybe also for some children not me but is also there's this like money component right and are our parents living through their children or and what what does how is that imbalance of power related to the financial influx from a child's career like it is it can be very tricky for people so i mean my parents were wonderful they saved it all for college and i bought a small house when i was 22 you know i it was all very it was done really neatly and very with a lot of love and care and that's not everyone's experience but the emotional impact of having had this huge job and everybody on knows who you are because there's no streaming services and everybody watches primetime <laughs> television yeah and then it ends yeah yeah and it's just yeah. done and at times wondering like is that going to be the best thing i'm ever done with my life and that's that is a hard pill to swallow and i think if you have all of your self worth wrapped up in that thing and then you have to start over. I've talked about starting over and pivoting so many times already, but that has been my whole life. And I guess not resting in what I've done in the past, but what I know I can continue to do in the future. And I think it's really hard if you don't have that kind of reserves of self-worth because this business does not care. The business itself and fame, not not real. You know, I, I you mentioned my my phrase before, and I'll stand by it. I think fame fame is a paper fire. It it ignites quickly and it blazes hot, and it goes out like that, and it's done. And if all of your self worth was wrapped up in that one moment, that's why people burn out. They burn out quickly, and you're like, "How did this person have it all? And now they're in debt and in the streets. And how did this happen to them?" Well, there's a lot of inflated ego, and there's a lot of people telling you you're great all the time, and then that one first rejection destroys you. When actually, it's a lot of rejection and a lot of tenacity and very small things that then become big things. It's always building, and now and then you get that great job, you get that huge win. And man, that's that's lucky. It's luck, a lot of it. I've definitely gone through. I've done a lot of work on myself. I've gone to therapy a lot over the years, and I'm not saying all of、it. this has ever come easily. My husband's a therapist.、Um, you know, it it's really in my business. It's always yeah. It's always up and down. So, so、cool. riding those waves of up and down, especially when you've had success. Is can be tricky. It, your ego can really do a number on you, and you know it's it's sometimes easier said than done, for sure. Yeah, I'm really thankful for your level of vulnerability here. It leads me to just a point of curiosity, because I I do want to talk about burnout. But before you were a teenager, you learned to be Al Lambert, and then you grew into her as a character. And you became everybody's first TV crush, which we'll talk about. <laughs> But I want to know, like, who was Christine Lakin after the show abruptly ended? Was it season seven? 
I think you've tipped yeah. your hat to this, but talk to me, Christine, about the internal inflection, this moment where, as I said, you grew into this character and now you are, um, okay, what happens now? Yeah. There's also something to be said for that moment when that safe space, that workspace that I had gone to every day for seven years was done. It's, it's like anybody who's worked at a company with a certain amount of people for a long time. And then you just never, you don't see them anymore. So not only is your safe space taken away, but your job in which you knew you were good at, and you knew that character and you knew you got laughs and you felt secure in that's gone. Um, and you know, just this idea that, um, these people who felt like your family are also, they'll always be close to you in your heart, but they're all going to go off and do other things. So it's like a lot of things at once. It feels like the end of an era. It feels like, and I was graduating high school and I was going to college. Like it, it was a lot of things happening, a lot of new. Um, yeah, it was not the most comfortable of times for me um, trying to navigate that. It was, um, it felt, I'm glad I had college. I did have something to focus on. Um, and I had a small group of friends that were, that were really, really supportive and that I felt really safe with, which was extraordinarily helpful. Um, I didn't do the college thing. I went to school, but I didn't do the college experience really. Um, but again, like, I think I always went back to what my safe spaces were, which were theater people. <laughs> you know, I saw, I was like hanging around people who worked in theater and I would see theater and I would, you know, it was, it was a lot of that in my early twenties and it gave me a sense of belonging. And, you know, aside from even it's the small things, right? Aside from it's, it's the, for me, it was never about stewing in my apartment and wondering if I was going to get that movie of the week or that next job. It was okay. I, I did that. And then I'm also got an exam and I'm also going to go to my friend's birthday party. And I'm also going to have a few people over to watch Buffy the Vampire Slayer or whatever it was. But it was having, I think that balance for me that was really helpful because it was, yeah, it was, it was uncomfortable. It was really uncomfortable and not knowing where you belong. It's, it's a, yeah, it's a, that's a hard, it's a hard transition. Um, and I think, you know, for actors too, who have played one character for a really long time, there's also this strange kind of mourning for the fact that you will never play that character again. That character becomes a part of you and you become a part of it. And where you end and they begin is sort of blurry after a while. Um, and that character meant a lot to me. I liked her. I genuinely would have been friends with her. I genuinely thought she was way cooler than I ever was. Um, I felt like I wanted to be more like her. I wanted to be, I wanted to have the funny quips all the time. I wanted to be completely self-assured all the time. <laughs> I wanted yeah. no one to mess with me. You know, she was cool and yeah, she had, right. people respected her in a way. And she like, didn't care what people thought of her. And I, as a young girl, cared very much what people thought of me. Um, I was a people pleaser. I was a, an actor. You know, I always, and I, and I still, I still, to this day in my personal life, I struggle a little bit with that. I struggle with that innate sense of, because I've been doing this my whole life. You want it how? I can do that. How shall I do that? You want it tomorrow? For sure. I can do it. You know, that's, that's the essence. That's the core of kind of who I am. I'm a hard worker, you know, and I, and I will, I will, I will deliver. And, but the other part of me, the part that wanted, that wants to be, <laughs> I think a little more like that owl persona is, is taking the moment and also asking myself if it's right for me. And 
that's been a life lesson that will continue. Standing up for myself will continue to be a little bit of a life, life skill that I continue to work on. It's hard for me. It's hard for me. I don't want to ever let anyone down and I never want to hurt anyone's feelings, but at, to, to what, at what cost, you know, authentic relationships are more important. And my, my own authenticity is more important but sometimes finding the bridge and the way in the ways in which to navigate uncomfortable situations have that's it's just been a it's been a learning curve so i think that's something that sort of came out of my innate like that work ethic as a kid um and i think especially as somebody who's a performer i think a lot of performers can relate to that people pleasing quality I really appreciate you bringing that up. We chatted about this offline too. Like I so resonate with that. I don't like disappointing people. Um, I tend to be a fixer and I think that's in my temperament too. Um, You had said, and I'll go, I'll go here next, but you had said that you would have loved to be friends. You would have been friends with Al Lambert. How different is Christine Lakin from Al Lambert? Just, Walk me through that, because I think, you know, we all, as a millennial, we all grew up watching Al Lambert, but that's not the complete epitome of who Christine Lakin is. Like, there's a there's a discrepancy. Walk me through that. Yeah. I mean, Al really was so self-assured, so independent, um, lived with two brothers, you know, for much of her life. Uh was very much, you know, not afraid, tiny and mighty, very tiny and mighty, you know, was great at all sports, um, was towards the end, like, I think boy crazy in the way that she used to love sports. And then she kind of loved boys. (laughs) It was Um, wild to watch that transition in the character. Yeah. Yeah, for sure. Uh, but was still like very much in her body was in her body essence all the time and and it was written that way and to be a 15 year old girl who actually felt very confident all the time and like always knew the thing to say and could always you know navigate a situation uh was not the way that I always felt I I mean I think a lot of young girls especially at that age and especially in the 90s, let's talk about a completely different era where body image, right? Body image was portrayed very differently. Um, we didn't have this term called fat shaming. Um, everything was about being, you know, non fat and ex- exercising and stick thin. And there were, there were just a lot of 90s body cons that I think we now look back on and say, whoa, what were we doing to ourselves, women? What were we doing? Um, So, you know, feminism was making a resurgence, but it wasn't, it's just, we don't speak about a lot of things in the same ways that we speak about them now. So growing up in that environment too, right? um, It was almost as if I could slip into the skin of someone who was more of that more of that feminist than I had felt comfortable being. And so the differences between us were, I mean, I wasn't good at sports. <laughs> That's why I did dance. Um, I was never first picked. I was always last picked because I was tiny and I didn't throw the ball very well. Um, you know, <laughs> there were a lot of things that uh, when you grow up on a schoolyard, don't make you feel great about yourself because everything in second, third and fourth grade is all about like, who's the best athlete on the, on the field kind of. And I was always in the corner, like making up dances <laughs> because that's what I could do. But that's awesome. I had, that's awesome. <laughs> yeah. And it was yeah. okay. I, I, I learned to find, like yeah. I said, I learned to find my people. And I think through that character learned, like it was, it was almost nice to embody, you know, people say, if you want to feel happier, try smiling. If you want to feel more empowered, try slipping on the skin of a character that feels completely empowering. Even if that's like someone, I mean, I got to actually do that. She was an actual character on a TV show. But I think about that sometimes. Like, 
are there alter egos? Like, I don't like walking red carpets. I find I am, uh, I am always nervous. I feel like an <laughs> imposter. I yeah. feel stupid. Wow. I like, well, how do I pose? And like, how do I look? I don't, uh, all of it just is not in my <laughs> wheelhouse. Some people love it. Yeah. Good for them. I'm not a model, yeah. <laughs> but in my mind, it's almost like I have to pretend I'm someone else. I'm a version of myself who loves it. Because if this version of myself loves it, then the picture will look like I too love it. Does that make sense? I you know, that. it's like, it, it totally does. Sometimes. Yeah. Sometimes I feel like embodying certain aspects of like, we should all have our own Al Lamberts. We should all have our own moments of, of <laughs> slipping into that skin of someone who is confident and can stand up in front of that board meeting and can give that presentation and whatever that person's name is, you want to make it Al, make it Al. But I do think that sometimes it can be helpful because I think imposter syndrome with all of us is all too real. And let me say this, no one knows what they're doing. No one knows really what they're doing. <laughs> We're all just figuring it out in business, in life, all the time. So this idea that we're all, fe we're all feeling like imposters at some point. That's an important thing to remember. I tell myself that all the time. I should have it tattooed. No one knows what they're doing, like on my arm. Because <laughs> <laughs> mm -hmm. I do think it's, it's often true. This is so good. I, I just, just to have a little fun, I mean, I mentioned it earlier, like how does it feel to be a lot of people's first TV crush? Because listen, I grew up here in Detroit, so for like all my friends in middle school, we were watching Step by Step going, they're right by us. And you know, it's like the temporary suspension of disbelief, to use the term in film, guys. Because there are a ton of millennials listening right now, Christine, so we're TGF faithfuls and... Uh, you know, like the girls had JTT and, you know, Zachary Ty Bryan and some of the guys had Topanga Lawrence and then the other guys had Al Lambert. How's it feel? <laughs> it's fun. Listen, it is, it is. Al was mine. I'll be, I'll, I'll be, I'll be candid. I'll be candid. Al Lambert was my first TV crush. So let's go, you know? <laughs> I love it. Thank you. So funny. Um, it's, yeah. it's beyond yeah, yeah. flattering. Are you kidding? It's like, it's so flattering. Um, and people will, you know, still tell me that to this day, uh, whether I'm at like a, an autograph signing or, you know, on cameo or whatever it is. And it's, um, and I, I, yeah, it's, listen, I am a product of the nineties as much as anyone else. So before I was on TGIF, I was watching TGIF. I was in love with uncle Jesse way too old for me. Didn't matter. Oh, I thought, Jessica you know, was, yeah. J <laughs> yes, I thought JTT was super cute. I was also crushing on him. The difference is that once I got on the show, I actually met some of these people in real life. And I was like, like inwardly freaking out, but outwardly just pretending like I could be cool about it. But yes, I, I mean, I was crushing on everyone as well. It's, it's flattering and I get it. And it was me too. And by the way, I did as well. To the extent you're comfortable, Christine, talk about your relationship with Suzanne Summers. I actually didn't tell you this pre-show, but really interestingly, my mom actually had some cool run-ins with Suzanne. They had the same doctor in New York City. Oh. And, uh, man, I ah, didn't realize I was going to poke a button today. Um, yeah, both had cancer. Um <laughs> I knew her doctor, Suzanne's doctor, Dr. Gonzalez, really well. And yeah, uh, yeah I just wanted to ask you, because I know she was like a second mom, but tell me about your relationship with her. How did she nurture? I, I can imagine there's a level of nurturing and great impact that she had in your life. She's She seems just like a gregarious, larger than life, compassionate soul. Yeah, she absolutely was. And yeah. It's still surreal. It's sur it's still surreal for me to think that she's not with us because her light was so bright. When she was around, I mean, not only was she incredibly beautiful, but she was incredibly generous 
and warm and self-deprecating. I mean, she was, she's a light. I, I truly never saw her in the seven years I worked with her. I never saw her have a bad day. I never saw her be cross with anyone. Um, she was just like a joy, a true joy to be around. And when you're 12, 13, 14 years old, growing up on a TV show, everything that happens as, and as I've continued to learn, the demeanor of that set is predicated by the people at the top. And those are your stars and those are your producers. And I give Suzanne and Patrick Duffy a ton of credit for making that set the way it was and setting a precedent of how to behave um, and how to treat others with respect. Oh, I mean, coming in on time, working on your lines, uh, being generous with your co-stars, being kind to the crew. Um, being generous with yourself, letting others have space to tell you about their life, um, being open, being kind to fans. Uh, I mean, I could go on and on. Um, you saw two people who played this married couple who, as I'm realizing in this rewatch podcast that Stacy and I have, uh, which we can talk about in a minute, but uh, they were very hot for each other. Yeah, Carol and Frank, very hot for each other. Um, <laughs> oh, oh so to gosh. see yeah. this relationship, yeah. right? Yeah. Two people, but you, but actually two actors yeah. who had such a genuine respect for each other mm. and liked each other an Incredible. awful lot. Mm -hmm. And it wasn't hard to like either one of them. I mean, they were both, they're both just in, incredibly wonderful people. But so there was a lot of that. And then also just on like a personal note, I... I just, I looked up to her so much. I, I, I just idolized her. I thought everything she wore was amazing. I thought she had the most incredible sense of style. Um, I thought she was such an incredible businesswoman. And I really saw that as I was in my formative teen years, I saw how hard she worked. She didn't just write a book. She wrote a book and pounded the pavement and made that book a bestseller. You know, she, had she was into fitness and exercise and came out with that thigh master and man she she was the most incredible um brain for marketing this was before people had instagram all right for so sure, she is yeah she was coming out with these products and a, and a wide variety of them yeah. and not only that but talking about food combinations and cookbooks and you know she came out with stevia and before it was stevia and i mean she was really on the cutting edge of a lot of this stuff and marketing herself in ways that now as i as i look back on it were ingenious um she people she grew up in this stereotype i think because of chrissy snow as p portraying kind of the dumb blonde and I think a lot of people from, from that era and from, I think, the negative press she received at the end of Three's Company wanted to sort of just, just write her off as that. But she was anything but and was, was just incredibly, um, uh, I mean, I, I, I gleaned so much just from watching her and knowing how hard she worked and also just from the generosity for the people around her. Um, it's, it was a masterclass truly in, in what it's like to be an icon. She was an icon. I feel really lucky that I had the time I did with her. Yeah. Such generous yeah. words about her, Christine. I, um, I wonder if I just like, as an interviewer, I like threading themes and threading things through in my mind. And you were talking as we spoke about earlier, discipline and reflex and pivoting and all that. I wonder if, because I think in life a lot is caught more than it's taught. I'm wondering if you gleaned, as you just said, a lot of that from her when you're nine, when you're 10, when you're 11, 12, 13, coming into adolescence and going, oh, this is how to do it, right? You learn from her. She had this massive career on Three's Company and then Patrick Duffy on Dallas and it's wild. Oh, mm. I absolutely. I mean, I, I think, again, you know, if you read her book, um, she talks about the end of Three's Company and sort of 
now we look back on that story and think, wow, asking for what you deserve and being villainized for it, not a great look. But back then, you know, women were not, uh, to ask for the same as, as what a man would make would be, was considered like horrific. And having to kind of live through that and then the aftermath of that and like how, what do you do? What do you do next? And how do you start over? And what is the next goal? What is the next pivot? And that was, that was essentially the space she was in. So Step by Step was the next kind of big show. Um, and I can imagine coming back to something like that after having been, you know, uh, sort of uh, ceremoniously uh, discarded uh, by a major network for many years. Um, was a, a another big shift, um, and to do so, and also have I think to not be so jaded by that experience, to not be so disgruntled or angry by that experience. You know, that's that's part of it. Um, but also, I think to remember that, you know, it, I mean, we could all go down a shame spiral <laughs> about anything really, but to remember that it wasn't about her but it was about the timing and the times that in which she was living in that were incredibly unfair. Um, but you know, I, I do think I, I caught a lot of things from both of them. You know, I watched Patrick Duffy direct a lot of our shows. Um, and I watched how he worked with us as the actor, but also the director. Um, there were things he did that were so funny that weren't on the page that he would just come up with. I mean, people didn't realize how funny and what a goofball he was because he'd played all these serious roles. So again, I go back to this idea that actors can be stereotyped. And a lot of people, even leading into Step by Step, said, Patrick Duffy, he's not funny. He's actually one of the funniest people I've ever worked with. <laughs> and if you, wow. I have all wow. these gag reels sitting by my desk, all these, you know, DVDs For that real. I have to look through. Wow. Um, and he, you would see on these gag reels uh, that he was, <laughs> he was inherently like one of the, I think, uh, one of the funniest people on the show, but just people didn't know that about him. So again, it's like changing these perceptions um, and having the tenacity to continue to do so without like, I, I, I mean, think about it. You could let that get to your head of like, oh, this person's not funny. They're not funny. And you could let yourself believe that, or this person's not worth the money that they're asking for. And they're greedy and they're a bimbo. And you could like internalize that. And that could just be kind of the beginning of the end. I, I think it's always really difficult to be met with a narrative and have the audacity to tell yourself a different story about yourself. And Will you say that again. I think that that line. I think that line was worth the price of admission today. Will you say that again? That was powerful. Yeah. I think that I say it's. I think it's hard to be met with a narrative, and have the audacity to tell yourself a different story about yourself. Because often people, and especially for people like me, people, do you know how many times I've heard, oh, step by step, that's the biggest thing you ever did. What happened to you? Where have you been? Do you know how that makes you feel? Do you know how that can make a person feel? Like everything they've been doing in their life has been worthless. It's a really hard thing to hear. Um, but I know all the things that I do and I have done in my life. And just because someone else hasn't been watching I can't fault them for that. But I have to know that like the things I'm doing, <laughs> and it's also not my, my job to educate someone. <laughs> There's something called Google. If only we had something in our pockets that could tell us in everything, all the information. <laughs> um, so, but, but that's like to be met with that kind of a narrative is like, oh, it's tough. Because it's not like if I worked at a bank, someone would, would come up to me and say, man, I haven't seen you at the bank. What have you, you just, it's, just, it's a completely different job. What was your favorite episode of Step by Step? Oh man, I have a couple. Um, the ones that stick out for me, um, 
early on, like in the second season, we went to Hawaii. Now, listen, this is back in the day. <laughs> all right. This is when yeah. like networks yeah. would spend a lot of money on television, different times. Uh, yeah. But we went to Hawaii for two weeks and we stayed at a really nice hotel that had a water slide, like had multiple water slides. And I was 13 years old. I mean, I was having the time of my life. Um, so that one really, I don't remember much about the actual episode, but I remember the water slides and I remember being at that hotel and I remember it being super special. Um, so that was super fun. Um, content wise, uh, there were things that I got to do later on in the series where at some point Al decides she wants to be an actress. And there were a couple of moments, one in particular is a, a, an episode, I believe it's called the understudy where of course Al auditions, but she doesn't get the part and she becomes the understudy and she lets her ego lead and says, this is ridiculous. I'm not learning these lines. This is stupid. I should have been the part. So forget it. And she doesn't prepare. And guess what happens? Of course, it's sitcom. The opportunity arises and she has to fill in and she's up the creek without a paddle. Um, but it, it was a fun episode to film, not only because Patrick Duffy directed it, but because I got to work with him a lot in the episode. And it was a lot of physical comedy, which he was always so good at and so good at teaching. And uh, it was it was kind of one of those noises off moments where, you know, a, the actor is flailing on stage and trying to figure out what to say and um, it was just really fun for me. Really silly, really fun. So that one also sticks out in my That's mind. Cool. Yeah. You know, what was so fun for me as a viewer. And I admittedly have gone back and watched several episodes just in prep for today and just want to kind of recalibrate my growing up in the nineties history and all that. And I started to notice now as an adult, all these little Easter eggs that would drop. For instance, there was that, there was the character, Rich Halkey, Dana's boyfriend. Yeah. And then I'm like watching the opening credits and I'm like, wait, story editor, Rich Halkey, what, what's happening right now? And so yep. even the way <laughs> the thigh master showed up in an episode, like you were talking yes. about Suzanne and then Patrick Duffy in that episode that you had just mentioned, he makes this allusion to, um, to Dallas when they would hide lines in props on, on the stage. Hilarious. Cause you know, he used to yeah. do that. <laughs> <laughs> Did he do that on step by step? No, he didn't, but it was pretty funny oh. because um, <laughs> a couple of times Suzanne did, and I don't know yeah. if she got that from him, but there is a one moment in the gag reel where she's, they're having this really yeah. lovely moment, and she's just, you can see her kind of fishing for the line, and she keeps looking down, and he's like, he looks at her, <laughs> and he stops the take, which was hilarious, yeah. and he's like, can you not see it? Is it in your hat? And she just starts to laugh. <laughs> and he's like, she's holding her lines in the hat right here. So you know? good. Um, so yeah, there good. was one I saw the other day because we were watching for the podcast. And uh, Suzanne yeah. is sitting on Patrick's lap um, in the living room. And they're doing a crossword puzzle. Mm. And he goes, huh, six-letter word for city in Texas. Ugh. And she goes, D A L L A S. And he goes, Oh, like that. Like, that's again, if you didn't know, that was one of the jokes that like went over every kid's head, but every parent thought was hilarious. And that was the beauty. That was the beauty of that show. And it was the beauty of that like perfect time in television where you actually wanted to watch the same show that maybe your kids were watching. And I wish that existed more of today. I wish there was more of that today. Mm. I do too. I, why do you think people get attached to TV characters? In other words, one of the things, because I'm so passionate about mental health and emotional health, and I'm like, sort of wish Brandon could pop in and, and I'd love his take as a therapist on this. Why we yeah. go back, for instance, I'll just be candid and say the folks on the show know I really dealt with some severe post-traumatic stress. And I remember in a season of burnout and just healing, I would go back and watch shows that were like a warm blanket to me a little bit. Step by Step was one of them. Everybody Loves Raymond was another one. Why do, is it the temporary suspension of disbelief? Is it the consistency? What do you think is about these characters that are like the warm blanket to our soul when burnout and anxiety are run in full tilt? Yeah, you make a really good point. 
And it's uh, mm. what you're saying is something I've heard many times mm. from people, um, especially really? people I meet in person. Uh, they'll say, you know, COVID was a hard time for me. And I went back to your show and it just, it got me through some dark times. And you think to yourself, really? Oh my gosh. Like our little show, even as an actor, you think I did something 30 years ago. Does anybody still care? But there is this nostalgia factor. I think it's a couple things. I think sometimes those things that we can go back to that provide us with the memory of a time in our life that was uncomplicated, um, that was maybe a before event, you know, it was, it felt you can remember, like I can remember laying on the ground on the carpet in my parents' living room. I can remember what it felt like. I can remember the pillow I used to take from the couch. I can remember the TV, you know, I can remember like on a Friday night ordering pizza that's and it's all of those little things that provided that cocoon of warmth during a time in my life in which it was very emotionally significant. So I think re replicating that is one thing. I think there's something else about the content of the show and whether it's step by step or it's friends or it's everyone loves Raymond or whatever it is, you know exactly how these characters are going to respond. And you feel almost as if they are a part of your family in a weird way, or like you're friends with them. And it, you know that everything's going to wrap up okay at the end. So it's the not needing to, it's the not needing to worry. I think there's also something just really, um, yeah, there's something just that, that feels really comforting about watching something that's going to, it's all going to be okay. And I honestly believe wow. that a podcast like this yeah. and a podcast, even like mine, what, what people are really yeah. coming for less, less yeah. even than, you know, recapping an episode. It's about the exchange of it's, it's about love. It's about the exchange yeah. of energy in that we were mm. coming to exchange this idea that we're, we're all in it together. I know that's a really big concept, mm for something that I'm talking so specifically mm -hmm. about a TV show, but, mm -hmm. but the fact that we can all feel the same thing watching something mm -hmm. and we can all feel like it's just, it's all going to be okay. Maybe there's something nostalgic mm -hmm. about a time that was just a lot simpler in a lot of ways. Yeah. Maybe because we were younger or maybe because the world was not as complicated. I'm not sure. But I think whatever those touchstones mm. are for us, um, are things that will continue to resonate with a generation mm. long after, mm. you know, even like their children start to watch it. I had no anticipation that I was going to get emotional in this conversation today, but I'm realizing as you're talking what these shows do for me, because life was really scary for like two decades. And I had told you, Suzanne and my mom had the same doctor and actually ran into each other a yeah. couple of times and, in New York City. And, watching those shows tells the adolescent in me who's now 40 41 like that's when life was safe it wasn't scary yeah yeah and the soul you. can go that's the that's the resting place that's the reminder that we're gonna be okay yeah. so for folks watching right now or listening to christine and me sorry we turned into uh this <laughs> but it is to say um <laughs> There, there's power in connection, and I think that's what I hear you saying. And that was even my question about yeah. our connection to characters. I think it's the fact that our souls long to be seen and to be known, which is why I even reached out to you in the first place, Christine, because here you and I are having a conversation. We're both in our 40s, and yet we grew up in the 90s. And I'm saying the compassionate part of me says, hey, everyone saw Al Lambert, but how many people actually saw and knew and valued Christine Lake. And that's just where my mind goes, you know, that kind of thing. So, mm. yeah. Thank you. I appreciate I, that. I'm, I'm so, ah, uh, you're welcome. And I'm so thankful for your, your time and just this wonderful conversation. I want to land here with you. Um, is there a question you wish more people would ask you, Christine? <laughs> um, it's a really good one. 
Gosh, you've asked me some really interesting ones. So I want to thank you for that. I, I really like going on a deep dive and especially when it comes to mental health, I think it's really important. Um, you know, I, I think people have asked me all kinds of questions over the years. Um, I think talking about, you know, my, talking about my own struggles. People want to know like, Oh, what was it like growing up on TV? And who was this person like? And what was that like? And I, and I, and I understand it's, it's super interesting and, and not, not everybody's life. Right. But I do think it's always interesting for me anyway, uh, to go on the deep dive of, of what was, what was the, tra what were the transition years like? So I, I appreciate that you asked me that because that's often not something that I think it's so nuanced, but I think it's also universal. I think anyone going through, whether you were a big sports star in high school or you thought you were on this trajectory in life and you ended up saying, oh, I think I hate my college major, or I didn't get into the college I wanted to go to, or COVID ruined my blah, blah, blah years. Like everybody is going through something and figuring out how to transition or pivot or becoming the more like authentic version of themselves. Um, so, you know, my experience might be unique, but I think there are parts of it that are universal. So for me, that's, those are the avenues of thought that I find really interesting to, to deep dive on because I'm constantly thinking like, what's next, what's next, what's next for me? How do I continue to become a better parent, a better friend, um, a a better, a better friend to myself. You know, these are the things that I constantly try to work on in those moments of anxiety or feeling like I'm not enough or feeling like, you know, that little voice that we all have inside our heads that tells us the things that, that gives us the narrative that we have the audacity to, <laughs> to stand up and say, no, thank you right? We're all very much alike. And the other thing I'll say, I just did some travel with my kids out of the country. And I haven't done that in over 10 years because of COVID and so many other reasons. But the thing that I came back realizing, and I think this is significant, especially sort of with the way that we, our country is at the moment and sort of the climate that we're in and about to be in, the thing I, rem I really came back with, the big takeaway, was that the world is kind. The world is helpful. We are one small part of a very big world. And people were so genuinely who didn't know us. They would see this family with a bunch of bags struggling to get on a train and so many times people lended a hand, gave a smile, like gave me a wink as my kids would be loud on a train and I would be like, sorry, sorry. And they would just give me that smile or offer up a seat. And, you know, I think we often forget because we get in our bubbles and behind our screens and on our social media or whatever. And we get sucked into this vortex that we're all like this or that or white and black. And we're all you know, and I don't mean racially, I mean like thought, thought wise, you know, and that we're, we can all be for or against. And I actually think we're not, I think we're all, I just think the world is a really big place. And if, when we can approach it with the idea that we all want, we're all struggling with a lot of the same things. And I think we all just want to be happy. Sometimes it takes that anxiety of the world is a dark place which can be unfortunately the biggest headline out there. <laughs> yeah. 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 You gave us a phrase much earlier in the conversation and it was learning how to say yes. And, and I just think that even epitomizes the heartbeat of what you just shared, like how to be people who position and posture ourselves with kindness in life, who say yes. And yes. And yes. Yeah. And so, yes. Yes. Christine Lake, and you are a gem. Seriously, thank you for taking time for me today. I've loved this conversation. This went 
way different than I ever thought it would, but this is, I think, the value of a great conversation, and I loved it. I absolutely loved it. Thanks for being here today. Anything else? Thank you so much for having me. Just thank you for having yeah. me. Thank you for having this platform uh, to talk Thanks, about, Christine. you know, mental health and the things that make us tick and the things that we struggle with. I think yeah. it's really important. And um, yeah, I'm, I appreciate it very much. Thanks, Christine. Hey, before I let you go, tell people where to stay connected. I know you're on the gram. Uh, you yes. and Stacey Keenan have a super great podcast. I binge it because it's just thank like, you. it's just a killer fun podcast. Tell us about that. Thank you. Yeah. So you can find me on yeah. Instagram. I'm yo Lakin. Um, and you can find our podcast. <laughs> I love that. <laughs> it's called Keenan and Lakin give you deja vu. And we are mm. moving into season two, but you can catch up on season one. It's a rewatch podcast where we break down all the episodes yeah. step by step in order. And then we talk about a lot of the behind the scenes of what it was like to grow up on so TV. And, you know, Stacey mm -hmm. Keenan has never watched the show, never watched it while it was on. This is the first time she's That's wild seen to it. me. Yes, me too, considering I was such a fan. I mean, couldn't you? I was sitting down at 8 p.m. every Friday so I could watch this show. I was just like, but she really? just didn't. Yeah. Oh, yeah, I loved watching it. I loved it. I, loved I was just it. like, couldn't wait to see how it turned out. You know, maybe it was the budding director in me. I don't know. Wanted to see how it all got That's put so together. Good. But she just had no interest in seeing herself. There were too many, I think. Wow blocks there not a lot of actors don't want to yeah. want to watch themselves but uh but anyway totally. we're watching totally. it now and boy is it ripe with memories oh. so yeah come and come and find us everywhere you get your podcasts yeah you guys i'll put links in the show notes at wintoday.tv in the gram as well but again christine I, seriously thank you this has been awesome of course anytime <laughs>